You're alive, Dr. Thorpe. Good evening. Uh, this is the March 14th Policy Committee meeting. I am Mike Thorpe, I'm the chair of the Policy Committee. Uh, let's do a quick roll call around the table of board members and administrators, starting to my left. Ed Salomon, school board. Mary of the Key School Board. Hannah Preston, administrator on special assignment. Sue Elliott, substitute superintendent. Matt Fredrickson, IT director. Ed Tate, school board. Bob Hickey, school board. Michael Roosevelt, school board. Thank you. Is there um, anyone on the phone? Is there anyone on the phone? Going once. Okay. Um, with that, we have a fairly light agenda. In fact, we've got one policy. Uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Mr. Fredrickson and Dr. Elliott. I believe you two are responsible for this one. Yes. Oh, you're okay. So thank you. Um, this uh, policy uh, tonight is policy 109, um, and it's about resource materials. And we wanted to take uh, another look at this policy and um, provide some updates to it. Uh, after reviewing uh, the policy as it um, is currently written in um, board docs, uh, we just have one suggestion uh, for a revision, uh, and that is on the screen in red. Uh, I checked with our solicitor uh, after um, looking at this revision uh, and uh, first looked at several other districts, uh, what um, their uh, policies are for this particular policy of 109, how some of their things are written uh, to look at uh, how some of the language could be refreshed and revised, and then um, wrote this particular uh, addition to or this revision to the policy and then asked our solicitor uh, to give his uh, review of it as well, make sure it made sense. Uh, he was fine with it as well. So the change here really reflects um, it, language that is very consistent in most of our policies where we, in guidelines, designate uh, the superintendent or designee, uh, and then after uh, designating the who, really looking at what the kind of um, guidelines of the um, direction is. So this is really to, uh, for the superintendent or designee to develop some administrative regulations, particularly around procedures for two things that in looking at what this policy speaks to, we want to make sure we have a little bit more guidance for, uh, for our families as well as for um, administrators and teachers. So first, we want to make sure that our parents, we have clearly um, outlined for parents or guardians that if they would like to request that their student receive an exemption from um, a particular resource material, which could be a library book, could be um, another resource material in the library, could be a supplemental resource material that's used in the classroom, um, that um, will create uh, clear direction um, for families to be able to um, share that exception. So if they want to want their child not to take out a certain library book, we'll have something clearly uh, written so they understand how they go about making that request. The second piece to this revision is um, creating some clear administrative guidelines around any complaints that um, uh, parents or community members might have uh, to certain resources and what's the, the procedure that they follow in order to um, submit their complaint. Currently, we do not have an administrative regulation for that, so it's something that we do need. Um, and I can, um, Hannah's been working on that with um, the librarian, so she can speak a little bit to some of the work that started around those pieces that would be complementary to this um, policy. And yeah, like Dr. Elliott said, we're working on the AR now. Uh, I've been working with our curriculum coordinators and the other librarians in the district to make sure that things are consistent and clear and mostly transparent for um, parents and community members. We don't want there to be any confusion. We want to make sure that parents are aware that they have those options. Additionally, um, the selection process is going to be a little more concrete and consistent, so that way it's the same for all of our buildings across the district. And lastly, making sure that we have that book sign-out process um, available in the student handbook for students and parents. So that way, if there are titles or materials that parents do not feel comfortable having their students access or sign out, they have those opportunities and it's available for them. 
Questions from uh, board members? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Yes, I'll start. Uh, I almost think it's written backwards. Um, where the parent or the guardian requests that students receive an exemption. I, I think it should almost be that the parent or guardian would have to permit it. Um, I just feel that a lot of the material in our library is inappropriate for the grade level of the person who has access to it. I would have, personally, I would like to see some sort of rating on some of the books that are in our libraries, similar to the movies that are shown. Um, like you said, some, some of the material, like I said, it's totally inappropriate. And if anything, I think the parent should have to give permission for her son or daughter to have access to it, as opposed to request that they don't have access to it. Uh, I don't know where you even start with this. I think uh, how you designate the books that we get and the material that we see, but it, it's wrong. I don't think it's, it's there's the, these kids just should, especially at the middle and the, and the elementary level, they should not have any access to this material, in my opinion, without parental permission. More like the movies that are R, X, or PG 13. A uh, middle school child has really no business being able to access an R-rated book without parental you know, permission as opposed to the opposite. <laughs> I know it's probably a lot of work that's involved, but I would like to see major changes to what we allow our kids to see in school. Mr. Roosevelt, who is the current designee? Superintendent, has the, did our previous superintendent make a designate, and if so, who is that person? So previously, it would have been in the curriculum area, so it would have been me as assistant superintendent, and then working with, depending on whether it was library or it was a particular curricular resource, it would have been that particular um, coordinator. That sounds like more than one person. This reads like it's either one or two people. Superintendent or a designate. Was a designee multiple designees chosen? Or was there one designee? Well, so the superintendent would have designated me as assistant superintendent. Okay. When it comes to a resource that would have been in a library or say in a classroom, I would have worked with that particular coordinator to research and, and to, to do the work around any kind of question or or um, someone was asking about a particular resource. So you have a pretty decent handle on what the material is either some people find objectionable and some people don't. Well, I'm not sure I'm understanding the context of your question. I have a handle on most recently what some, some parents have found objectionable. Um, prior to, you know, there are times every year where there are people that might raise a question about uh, a resource or some material, um, and we address it as we always have. If the parent doesn't want their child to use that resource, we honor that and we find an alternative for them, um, and and talk with them about you know what their concerns are and find out. Okay. Um, oh, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Okay. No, you're good. <laughs> So I, I think just to be clear, this, while this is a public school district and we have libraries in the public school, they're not public libraries. We don't have members of the general public coming into our schools to sit in libraries and pull out material. I believe that's correct. So, I, so would it be fair to say that all of the material in our libraries are intended to aid in resource and or aid in the development of education or the completion of assignments that our classes within the school district could undertake? Or is it broader than that? It's broader than that. Our libraries are there to instill interest in reading. So it's beyond just a particular academic subject or an assignment. 
um, you know, from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. We try to encourage our students to um, enjoy reading and, and learn from books and, and discover things through reading. And we have a variety of books in our library to meet the various needs of our kids, just like other libraries do. Yeah. Do we evaluate what material is appropriate for elementary encouragement of reading and completion of assignments, middle school and high school? Yes. There's a scale of that. So Absolutely. if it's, that's how. Mm -hmm. And I think the selection process will help with that too. We try to, we're trying to make it so that way there's step, step, step by step procedures in place. Um, I know our librarians work really hard to make sure that the material that the students are reading and the material that's in the libraries is developmentally appropriate for them. Yeah. And going off what Dr. Elliott is saying, also keeping in mind interests of students, interests of the community, to make sure that things are available for them. I'm looking. Sure. I'm familiar with the, the process involved for district approved novels. We go through a, a very specified process, and those novels are approved by the district and for use within classroom instruction. As I understand it, we're talking more, you use the word supplemental, we're talking supplemental materials, not specifically core curriculum materials. That's correct. And in doing so, well, I appreciate, um, you know, concerns of the community and parents, and Mr. Hickey, the concerns that you raised I'm, I'm very, very cautious about labeling books in any way prohibiting or banning books. There's, there's such a variety of acceptance, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is okay for your child, what's okay for my child. And I think that I, I want to be cautious on the side of prohibiting books that are really meaningful and necess necessary for some students who see themselves reflected in certain novels. Um, so I, I, I don't know how we could accommodate a rating system for books. Not to disagree, I, I didn't say, I didn't mention the word banning books once. I said putting a, I didn't say not allowing the books to be in the school. Um, but, I, you know, the books that are accessible to middle school kids involving sexual situations is totally inappropriate for a 12 or 13 year old boy or girl without any permission from their parents as opposed to the parents having to realize what the book is and then finally saying, oh, no, no, I, I don't want him to have it. I think it should be the other way around that the parent should have, if, if me as a parent want to give my child access to homosexual situations and allow that to be read by a sixth grade student as a parent i'm his primary giver so i can allow that but i don't want my sixth grade student having access to homosexual or sexual situations that are totally inappropriate not maybe even knowing that the book is there and having to write i don't want my child to see this i mean there's I don't know what the criteria is for even accepting these books into like what's the process where a book like that even gets into our system like like who determines or what is the process like for a book to get into a library like that and, and like i said i'm concentrating on the middle schools but i mean some of the stuff is probably even inappropriate at a high school level now granted you have high school students that are 18 years old maybe a different situation but before you answer that, because that was my question, how do you get books in? Is it consistent? Just add that to the, is, is library library, is it consistent? Yes, that's what we're currently working on now. So we're working on the selection process to make sure that it is consistent um, from library to library. So that means it is not now? No, I think that it is yeah. now. Okay, all right. Yeah. I just, just yeah. making it more concrete so that way you can sit there and go through, this is what they did first, this is what they did next, this is the process they're going through. So, so what is the selection process? Like? Currently, the selection process? The librarians go through the different titles to think about. To find the through, I'm sorry. To find so the if they're looking at titles that they're going to purchase, they would then read some of the book, 
um, see it list on the list for a college app winner or something that's been interested by students in classrooms and then see the relevance of the book if the book's developmentally appropriate for those students make sure they preview the book and then they can also have teachers read the books um, things like that to make sure that they're consistently yeah, I mean, look, the board received <coughs> excerpts from various books around the year. Um, this is a national headline in some areas. Um, I, I want to find a line. I, I tend to agree with Mr. Hickey. I, I, if my daughter went and picked a book out, how would I know what the content of the book is until everybody came down? And by just some of the pages that we received this year, I, I question what the process is and who signed off on some of that content. We've had some red public comment that, that makes us all just right. step back a little bit. Uh, so I don't know. You can give me a title that says, you know, it's whatever. How would anyone know what the content of the book is? And it, it, it is acceptable to a 12 year old, 18 year old, even an adult. And, and I've heard, well, it's, it, you know, in one awards, I, I don't really want to hear that because that's, a, you know, there's a lot of movies that have won awards that I won't let my kids watch. So I, it's a fine line for me because, you know, I'm not looking to ban books. I'm just looking to tighten the ship up a little bit um, because there's, these kids are, it's heavy duty right out there in, in our schools right now. There's a lot they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and if they're reading things about some of the things that we've seen, there's got to be a concern from a whole lot of people. But how do you manage it? And I think that's, that's kind of where I am. Well, I think, too, when parents have the opportunity, when they write in that they would like their child to not own specific books or specific content. But that's my question. So I don't want my kids reading books that involve oral sex. So those would too be like a young adult book. Okay. So if you, all of our books would have that title, the YA on the side. We, so, don't, we don't really have too many 19 to 21 year olds in our district. That's what I would describe as a young adult. Young adult books start at age 13. Well, that's not an adult. That's, that's the, okay. So that's the category. The category of young adult literature that starts might be a 13 to 18. And that might be a problem. A 13 year old is a minor. That's not an adult. Let, let's let no, Mr. Mr. K. Oh, and for the record, uh, this is Marcel's on the phone. She's driving in. But Mr. K, let, let, let. thank you. Um, Dr. Elliott, yes. what's, what's the impetus for this policy change? What's, what's driving it? I mean, obviously, we've all seen. Uh, an occasional email from a parent. We've heard comments, and there are some things that are alarming. But uh, is that really what's driving this policy change? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the bulk of what what's driving this. And I, I think too, what what we have to be careful about is that we're not judging a book based on a few excerpts that someone has read or shared. Uh, our librarians, when they're when they're making selections about of books, you know, they're looking at what they know about the students that they serve. What are their interests? What are some of the things that our students are dealing with? And they look for books that will speak to the students. They look for books that speak to uh, relate to curricular areas that that um, students might be studying. And and they also look at the age appropriateness of books. Are there times where maybe they select a book and when they first select it, they think it's right for that age level and then make a change? Absolutely. And that's something that they're very open to doing and, and evaluating books. And that's something that in the work that HAND is doing, they're looking at how do we, you know, how do we tighten up a little bit of our selection process and how we're reviewing our books. So that, you know, when you think about the hundreds of books that librarians order for their libraries, it's impossible for them to read them all. There's no way they can read them all. They rely on reviews. They rely on the American Library Association and other organizations to provide information about books. And what we want to do in tightening this up is, if there's a book that raises a particular question, um, whether they see that in other locations parents have questioned that book, or they know that it may appear on some lists that they see, that Part of what we want them to be able to do is, okay, certain books before we purchase this one, we're going to read this one and we're going to take a good look at this one. But they can't do that for every single book. And, and so we have, to be, we have to be careful. The other thing that we need to really be careful about is 
the the determination of what lists of books count as those if if it's something that you know we talk about you know and I, and I hear you Mr. Hickey you don't want to ban them I understand that but putting labels on books is in essence censoring a book or putting them somewhere where only you can only get them if parents give you permission we need to we need to just think very carefully about who determines what that list is and and we have to be careful that we're thinking about everyone that our district serves and so hearing from some parents about some books that they wanted to have um, put you know either coded in a certain way or put you know behind a locked door or you know some different ideas they have you know we want to be careful that we're not taking one group of parents list of books and using that list from that one group of parents to make a decision for the entire district um, I'll just make a follow-up comment. Um, you know, I think we've all seen the email, we've all seen the news stories and so forth, and I think this seems like a logical approach to try to manage the challenge in, in a clear, I, I wrote down what Ms. President said, a consistent, clear, and transparent way. Um, I think it's the way that it gets administered the way that the um, administrative procedure guidelines, what do we call those ARs, administrative regulations, mm -hmm. the way that the AR gets written and the way that it gets enforced, I think, is the real challenge. Um, because to your point, Dr. Elliott, uh, you know, we don't want to let uh, a few objections to a particular piece of literature um, get it restricted from access to all of our students. Um, there's, there's a lot of great books that have passages that are unsettling and that are not appropriate for an elementary kid maybe, uh, not appropriate perhaps for a middle school kid. Um, and we have to make sure that what's in our libraries is appropriate for the grade level as I believe you said earlier, Ms. President. So I think this is a reasonable approach to handling a challenging situation. Um, but it, as I said previously when we talked about this issue, it is a slippery slope. And you know we want kids to be able to access books that are interesting and appealing and relevant and speak to their lives and allow them to enjoy reading and stretch themselves. And um, you know, if there's a book that is particularly alarming, then it ought to be reviewed. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think parents ought to know what their options are. Um, and I, I trust that this will get implemented in a, in a wise fashion. All right, okay. Go ahead. Just, just a quick So have you had any parents come to you this year about books that you deem the date being inappropriate. Yes. And what was the resolution on it? So there was one parent that came forward and wanted a book removed from a library in the fall. Uh, reviewed that book. I read the book and um, responded back to the parent that we were not going to be reviewing it. Felt the book was appropriate for high school. And that if that parent did not want their child reading that book, that all they needed to do was let us know, and we would make sure their child didn't read that book. So, you are, I don't want to say arbitrarily, but you were the sole decision maker on that, in that process? In that case, yes. I reached out, I talked to the librarian, uh, talked to our library coordinator, I reviewed the book, reviewed uh, reviews of the book, and, and made that determination. I, I just, I, like I said, I, I can't fathom the fact of what we allow our kids. It's, this, this should be something that, you know, it starts at home. It, it's something that's between, between the families that they want. To, and like I said, I think the parents should be the one that allows their child to access this material as opposed to having to ask for permission to have a book, to not let their child have access to a book. And I think we're doing it backwards. 
And, and I'll agree with what you know, Mr. Roosevelt said. Maybe what the problem is, is we're categorizing our books wrong. They're not, kids in seventh and eighth grade are not young adults. They are adolescents. And maybe we should categorize our books as adolescent books. Well, or, Mr. Hickey, that's not our cat categorization. That is national. A young adult book category is 13 to 18 years old. That's that's the category. And it's it's very broad. But that's the problem. Well, you know, there's lots I, of books in that category that, you know, I know that you have, you're expressing objection to certain things. There are a lot of books in the young adult category that are across a breadth of topics and subjects and, and you know, saying that all books that are young adult are inappropriate for middle schoolers would be too broad of a statement. Can, can I, uh, just as a follow up, if, if somebody in a classroom read this packet, pack, a passage from these books aloud into his class, would he be disciplined? Well, I think the teacher would probably have a conversation with him. I, I can't speak to what the discipline would be at this point. We need to talk with the building principal and find out what's the context of how that happened and, and under what circumstance was it. Mr. Mark, let the record show Mr. Marcellus in, 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 in our presence now. Um, I haven't talked yet. I'll talk very briefly. I, I, um, I hear everyone around the table, and I'm glad we're not talking about banning books. That was tried. It doesn't work out really well. Um, I think some of these, and, 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 and I, I like what's in, in red because to a certain extent, Mr. Hickey, you and I may disagree a little bit because it, it gives the parents some choice. Um, can we publish a list of what could be, and, and, and I'm asking my board colleague here, what could be deemed? One of the problems, and I think I'm, I'm reaching for you, Bob, one of the problems is parents don't know unless, just like librarians, they've read all the books. Uh, is there a way that we can, you know, float, you know, Frequent flyers in terms of complaints up for for parent. I I I I really firmly you heard me say for two years believe in parental choice, and I'm trying to give that. And 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 I think that's what this is trying to reach for. I, I just am trying to find a way to have informed parental choice, and, and so that's the, that that's the only thing I'm and I'm I'm kicking out to board members for their right. opinion. So I think one stop. Once the book comes home, it's too late at that point, unless you know ahead of time. So how would you know ahead of time that there's not an additional layer in there that would bring it to your attention? I mean, the, the titles are very unassuming. If I want to use the word, the, the, the book uh, Lawn Lawyer, which the one that was out earlier in the year, I have no idea what that's about. So I get halfway through the book, and now I'm saying it's not, it's not interesting. Um, that's that's not that's not something I'm saying. So. You know, we, we can spin this around all night. I don't, you know, yeah. my, we, what layers, I mean, I, how many books would we get in the library on a yearly basis that, that our librarians would be ordering that would have to go through a review process, a, a legitimate review process where we would get cover to cover. And I would even argue, you know, you might even consider a parent committee to come in and also read those books and have them going in there to see what the, the feedback is <clears> of the books. I mean, what, what works in my house may not work in other houses, so that's that's another issue that you have. Um, this this is a very touchy and tricky subject matter. I wish we had what Mr. He referred to a, a, a rating system for for books uh, such as there is for movies, but there isn't one. Um, and and yeah, young adults is very broad. I, I think it's a, it's actually it's a, it's a term of art in the publishing industry. There's young adult books. Um, and I, I don't know, um, without that kind of system, how we could possibly evaluate books coming in. Um, I, I think that if there's a problematic book, a parent will have an option now to, to go to the administration and know exactly how to pursue it, 
Um, and, you know, I don't, I hope it doesn't happen, but I foresee a day when, when there's dental agreement that on, on further review, a, a book is deemed inappropriate for the middle school library. And it's better, it better belongs on the high school shelf. That's a possibility. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't preclude that as much as, as much as I don't like the idea of restricting literature and stuff for kids. I mean, I think that's a possibility. Uh, but I think all, what we're talking about here is a, is a process. It's a procedure, and I think parents across the board should welcome it. What? And Mr. Tate, I'm trying to keep this focused on the policy. There's there, there's more to it than. Policy. I, I, I'm in agreement with you. I, I think this is this is a st and, and listen. This board can modify policies at a whim. I mean, I, we can call a policy meeting. Um, I, I'm going to defend our administrators over here that I, this is a, a, a start. I mean, we've got some strong opinions, and, 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 and I see that more as procedural than policy. Um, I'm, I'm trying to separate the two, to, to, to Mr. Hickey and Mr. Rosenberg, who spoke so strongly. Uh, and, and I happen to agree with them, but I, again, we're, I'm trying to concentrate on policy here. And this this cleaned up some language where it was building principle and it was the wild, wild west. And, and I was, I, I'm grateful that I don't think it was as consistent as, as you, you two think it is. But that's OK. I mean, we're, we're, OK, it's been brought to the attention of right. We're, we're resetting. That's fine. Like, you know, um, that goes to the same consistency I've asked for in elementary schools for everything education. So I, I, it's fine. So to the board, I mean, I think there's there's two pieces. This one could be a board discussion about you know book rating and what what whatever you know where we can fully advertise. This is policy, and this is frankly you know a change to give us some knots to turn here. Um, and, and I, I want to stay focused on that. If I, if, if we could, I can talk about whatever you like. But <laughs> if, if we could, um, this is a step in the right direction. So uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I was trying to keep, keep tighten the lanes back a little bit on this one. Um, I will entertain it at, at, after we get through the, the policy part. The board would like a longer discussion about this at a meeting or an education or if it fits in policy or policy committee. We could do that, but let, let's let's try and you know um, this at least now is a clear line of who's responsible. I mean, before I don't know that it was clear to parents or anyone who's responsible. So you know, Dr. Elliot, it's you. <laughs> so uh, for good or for bad, it's right. you. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's a good start. Sorry, I, I will. Yes, I was just gonna. To add, I agree with you. I think we have to kind of stay focused. Like there, there are different areas here. So from a policy perspective, I think this makes sense. Um, and certainly, to your point, um, you know, we can make changes later if it seems like something maybe isn't working, or we need to. Once we've talked more about the other side of this, if there's something that we need to change in order to make them like congruent, we can do that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind just knowing like how many young adult books there are uh, for the middle school. Like, I, just like I don't, I don't know about this. Um, so I think it's worth another time, just you know, having a discussion and, and trying to just get some questions answered. So I think people, I've heard from parents that they're really just looking for some transparency and and information. Um, and so I just think it might be worth, you know, have not for tonight, but you know, having that type of discussion later. Um, so that we can help have a discussion as a community about about it and how parents can feel like they know about what is in our libraries um, and and for our board like you know, I honestly before this issue I didn't know that much about the process for library books because I was more familiar with our curriculum reviews um, instead of this so so thank you for answering so many questions well and I can say to your one question when you talk about young adult books in our middle school libraries, thousands upon thousands of books are young adult books because it's written for students age 13 to 18. And there's, I mean, and then our high schools, hundreds of thousands of books there would all be considered young adult books and fit into that category. So yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. So there's 
there's that aspect of it. Yeah. And I would, I would defer, and I, I know you too, but just, they haven't even written an administrative regulation yet. So mm -hmm. let, let's let them kind of sort mm -hmm. out the process a little bit and then come back and, and, and at a board meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, your hand was up. Yeah, and, I, and you kind of just answered my question because as I'm reading that first line, the superintendent or designees designate shall develop administrative regulations that set procedures. So you haven't <clears throat> set those procedures or regulations yet. That's correct. And once they are set, then we'll get another bite at the apple, so to speak, to agree or disagree. Well, to be clear, administrative regulations are written by the administration that are not approved by the board. It's not a that's not something the board votes to approve. You can get feedback on them, but it's not something the board votes and approves an administrative regulation. Then I don't want to say no offense, but then I don't know if I want you to have sole authority on the administrative regulations. I, I don't know how to do that, whether it's done by group of three or whatever, but I, I would prefer not to have one person setting policy and procedures that can't be reviewed by the board. Well, I can tell you that I wouldn't be the sole person writing an administrative regulation. It would be something that would involve other administrators, teachers, other cabinet members to review. So it would not just be one person who would sit and write it and decide what it is. And, and I'll address part of this as someone who's been policy chair for a couple of years. We came with the stroke of the pen, take that line out later. If it does, I mean, in the, but the board only sets policy. We need to let the administration set the, the regulations. So, I mean, the board, the board sets policy, and, I, and, I, and, I, and that came out threatening to the administration. And I'm sorry, it was not meant to be. It was, it was just, you know, this is this is our lane. And I, and I talked about lanes. This is our lane. This is the, this is the only lane we have. It, 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 and, and and like I said, this this gives the administration a chance to attempt to accommodate everyone. Mr. Um, to the best of their ability. In the past, when we've made modifications to policies that require an administrative regulation, we usually then share that administrative regulation with the board for their feedback before it's published. All of our admin regs are admin regs are published on the website and are accessible. And there is nothing to say, as Dr. Thorich just said, policies can be revised, and so can the admin administrative regulations. It's what we found in the past when Mr. Tate and I were doing this for three years, changing updating all these policies is that a lot of the admin regs had to change because the policies themselves changed. Mm -hmm. So, and we always got feedback from the board, board when we did that. And, so. and my experience, and, and, and to our new board, my experience has been the administrative regulations follow the spirit and the, and the heart of these regulations. I, I, I'm, because I've been doing it a lot, I'm a little more trusting that you, you haven't been a part yet, so, uh, and it's fair, it's fully fair, but I, I um, it's easy to want to reach deeper than you should, and, and this is one of those cases where I, it, it, we're, 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 we're coming out of our way. Okay. okay. And, 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 and Mr. Hickey, we, we, a couple board members asked for a policy review. We can have one. And so that I, I really want you to, to feel like I'm not trying to silence any, anybody's opinion here, but if, if this doesn't work, and bring it in front of us again. Okay, so, fair enough. Mr. Rosal? Yeah, I appreciate this. I think it is a step in the right direction. I would like to have further discussion on it. And with respect to the administration writing the, proce the administrative procedure and regulations, it's completely understandable that the library does not have the ability to read all the books that are considered. Yet, here, it sounds like we're asking a parent who has a full-time job, not being paid full-time to be a librarian, to be able to read all these things, to decide what to opt out of. So I just would ask, I think that our current procedure for bringing books in might need to be evaluated. And I wonder if, under this new administration and regulation, if there's some books that you might want to take back if there's some books that you might want to kick up to uh, to another library, um, and but that I, I do think it's important that, that we 
talk about this again from a broader perspective. Um, but this is a, a start in the right direction. And uh, I've also struggled with what Mr. Hickey said is instead of an opt out, do we consider an opt in? But if we even touch on this, I think that our procedure should be evaluating a book that might be opted in or opted out. I think that, that our regulations need to, need to take that considering. Um, anecdotally, I'll just sort of add, if the books that are being added reflect what our kids in the district are going through, their interests, it occurs to me there is a lot of religious and spiritual people. How many books do we have in our library that are spiritual in nature? There are a lot of people in this district that hunt and fish. How many of our books are featuring that? Are we comfortable with the guns and ammo magazine in our library? Because that might reflect some of the interests of our community. If those are off limits, how can we decide that others are? So I think that if you think about those when you're writing your regulation, that might help this community. Thank you. Uh, in terms of policy, um, I, I support this policy change, and I find it to be very responsive to the concerns that we've heard uh, through email, through our board meetings. Uh, I feel that administration has heard those concerns, and this policy change is really responsive to that. I find uh, I find this to be a good solution. I would be supportive of this. If if I could throw something out that maybe brings us all together. As we bring in new books, is it possible to just post a book list on the website? Am I asking too much? Am I going too far? But just these are the books coming, just titles and authors. And 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 and, and new books, not all the books. <laughs> new new books. Um, or, or is it reached too far? I, I don't know. Um, that's not the right way. But but it, it, it is it becomes transparent then because middle school, there's the books. High school, there's the books. Um, and and parents. I, I hear you about can't read everything, but that's kind of part of. I mean, parents have to bear part of this too. It, 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 Absolutely. It, it both, you know. So there, there's a, a list. It, it, you know, it's informational. I don't like the word transparent. It's just information. Yeah. It's yeah. just that. Information. I mean, that's something we could we could talk to the librarians about. I, I don't have a sense of how know. many books they buy. In it. I mean, they're replenishing. Their, their collections all of the time. So, you know, the, the lists could be very long and they don't all buy the same books across all the libraries. So all 10 elementary schools don't necessarily buy all the same books every year. They buy based on what the interests of the kids are in, in their school. And the same with the two middle schools and the two high schools. I mean, there are books where, you know, we have a copy of it at North, but we don't have that book at South because the librarian itself, based on uh, the librarians, because there are two of them, based on the interests of the students and, and kind of what what they're seeing, decided that a book, that book, that another, that North bought wasn't something they needed for their library and vice versa. Uh, so that happens all the time. So it would be, you know, 14 individual lists of books, which might be a bit surmountable to post somewhere. So how do we get feedback of the interest of the kids in order to buy those books. Like, what are they? Are they I know, Hannah, you've been I mean, talking with the librarians about how they, you know, like how do they, they get a pulse of what, what fits in Holland Elementary School versus what fits in Salt Pond School? I think they also think about the initiatives of the building. Yeah. They talk to the teachers. Um, and I know that these policies would then carry through from the classroom library to the school library. So that's another key point of consistency that I think is important. Um, I think similarly to how the teachers are selecting books for their class and library. You know, you listen to the kids, you are involved in the community, and I think our teachers do a really great job, you know, you know doing that. They're, they're heavily involved. So I think the same goes for the librarian. When they have the classes in for library class, they can quickly <coughs> pick up on what those children are interested in, what's going on around them, and making selections that way. But I think that selection process seems consistent. So like Dr. Elliott said, the, the titles of the book may be different, but the process and how they're selecting it seems the same. Mr. Salomon, I texted the uh, curriculum coordinator for librarians. 
And she said the number of books they purchase each year is based on the billing budgets. Um, you know, so they're given an amount that they can use on new books. And then they also take during the year feedback that they get, as Hannah just said, from teachers and from students. Hey, do you have a book about this? Do you have a book about this? And that's kind of how they gauge it. They also look at the book fair. So when the book fairs are in the buildings and they see what are the books the kids are buying the most of in the book fair, then they're like, okay, I'm going to make sure I get books on that topic. Or, you know, with they get a lot of, uh, all, most of our book fairs are all through Scholastic and they get Scholastic dollars for hosting the book fair. So then they'll purchase a lot of the books that the kids were buying. So they have those in the library as well. And I think too, just being in the class, I know from being in the classroom, each year it changes. You know, it varies a little bit. The kids will come up to you and they'll express to you the books that they're into. One year it could be Greek mythology. The next year it could be fantasy mm -hmm. fiction. Like they, they know what they like also based on what you're reading to them. If you start reading The Lightning Thief, they get really into The Lightning Thief and now you have 25 recurring books that they're going to want to also have. So I think that's important too that it does, like Dr. Elliott's saying, those titles change every year. And I think that's because the kids change. So you want to keep it interesting for them to keep their love of reading going. So it never really yeah, I think it's important for the community to hear that from, from somebody from the administration. It's great to have folks here this evening. I'm sure there's going to be some, several comments. So, I yeah, the policy is a start. I think, you know, the pulse is there. There's a, there's a want to fix or to address some of the things we've done. But I don't think we lose sight of some of the things that may not be, you know, addressed in everyone's minds on the board. But I think this cleans up. A lot of things, and at least starts the process uh, fine-tuning things a little better. But this this is a hot-button issue for a lot of people. So I I, I applaud the fact that the administration is getting ahead of this as much as we can, in light of everything else going on, um, because I don't think this is going away. Right? Yeah. Um, I support the notion, and I would like to see an added sentence in here that the librarians do post a list of the books. That they're considering buying. I also have considering or, or, or are buying because I don't know that we are buying. Okay, are buying, right? Let's let's do that. Um, Mr. Roosevelt, this covers more than just books. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. Could well, could you give us a little time to evaluate? Absolutely. So and then we could work something in the administrative regulations. Just that well, new resources are published so that, parents can see. That, that would be fine. I, I, I'd like to see something in there along those ideas on one side or the other of the policy. The other thing that I don't want to lose sight of is a lot of this discussion is taking it in an innocent direction. And I appreciate that, the lightning thing. But I have a hard time believing that a student or a teacher has come up to the library and say, you know, I'm really interested in oral sex. Could you get me a book about that? So, I mean, there is an innocent element on this, but there's also another side of why we're having these problems. So I. That's, I don't want to lose sight of that either. I just wanted to say, as Mr. Solomon has noted, it's really nice to see a lot of folks from the community here, particularly students. I'm glad that you all care enough to be here. Um, and I support this. <coughs> so move this, move this to the board meeting for approval. <coughs> um, anybody? I'm going to start. I'm looking for nods. Move this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can move this. We'll have our second read at a board meeting, and uh, and vote it in. Okay. Same Thank you. If that's if that's okay with the board. Um, Ms. Preston and Dr. Ellie, I thank you for. I mean, I, again, this is step number mm -hmm. one, um, and and let, let's see where where it takes us. So. Um, that's our only policy. Um, I'll, I'll open it up for a couple of comments in a moment. But are there any other board comments that, um, that uh, you want to address? Mr. Tate. Yes, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, 227 was on the agenda, and it's, and it's not on uh, the revised agenda. Um, and as I think most of you know, I'm interested in talking about 227. Um, that's our drug and alcohol policy. Um, and um, I know at least a couple of other board members, several other board members are interested in talking about it. Um, 
We don't need to rush into a decision at all. It's a long-standing policy. Uh, but some of us have had up close and personal encounters with this policy, particularly the, I'm speaking of the 45 day suspension. Um, and I understand the concept of deterrence and that's why some really smart, caring people voted to implement a 45 day suspension um, several year, a number of years ago. Uh, but I think when you see how in effect it, it can impact students and, and the breadth of cases, I mean, um, you're talking about kids um, from seventh grade to through senior year in high school, um, which is a huge span of a, of a child's life. Um, and a 45 day suspension affects kids in that entire range. Uh, and the, the range of incidents um, is, is huge. Um, and and I, I think we ought to take a look at whether or not a mandatory 45 day suspension, in effect it's mandatory, um, is reasonable for students at all grade levels in all instances of drug and alcohol possession. Um, you know, I think we ought to look at what other school districts are doing uh, and we ought to have a careful consideration as to what makes the best sense for Council Rock. I don't think what any other school district does has to drive what we do, but I, I think, you know, uh, some of us have done a little bit of benchmarking and, and we see that uh, the drug and alcohol policies at different school districts, and oh, by the way, the, most of that information you'll find because statewide, the, the numbering system for school board policies is the same. It's pretty easy to find on a school district's website. You go to 227 and there it is. Um, and, and we ought to look at what other school districts are doing and think about our 45 day suspension policy and how that impacts kids and whether or not that's still the reasonable thing to do. Um, and we can schedule for a policy meeting a couple of months from now to have uh, we could, we could ask for administrative recommendations. For, for the record, we're shooting for June or July when the administrators are not addressing learning loss Good. and schools out, and we can do a careful consideration of this because the last time we reviewed this, we asked the administrators if they wanted to change, and they did not. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, and so I have already embraced it. It was announced at the last public meeting that in June or July, we're gonna have to figure out when it fits so we're not doing it during school time because I, I want the administrators to be part of this and do it carefully and thoroughly. Um, we have, and, and frankly, we can't change policy now anyway, mid, mid year, so. Yeah. So um, we had the, the goal yeah. would be to look at it over the summer and if there is an appetite, change it for next year. So yeah, and, and I think um, you're right. All those stakeholders ought to be part of the conversation as well as the community. Yes. I mean, we, we often talk about understanding how the community feels about a policy or a process, and this one may be one of the big ones. Um, well, that, that, it, it, you know, we ought to know we ought to know particularly what parents think about this policy. I, 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 I think we're getting a little before the whole. We, we, we want to start a conversation. We just I'd like to start it in June so that we can get those people all, all, all on the table at the same time versus hashing it out ahead of time so that they I'm already not, know about I, I, I am not proposing to hash it out ahead of time. I'm okay. just putting it on the table. Okay. Yeah, the only thing I'll piggyback on though, even though we're going to talk about it in June, it might be in our best interest or in parents' best interest, administrators, to at least think about it and think about what possible changes they may like to see. I know like you had said, We've done some investigative work now as to what other districts are doing. Um, but as opposed to just saying that they do district X, Y, and Z, maybe come up with what we feel the policy should be, and then we can kind of tinker with it as opposed to starting from square one where we only have a, a one committee meeting or maybe two to change the policy. Yeah, that, that, that's not, the goal is the administration usually does homework ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, this policy was not hashed out. This, this was the administration 
talking with principals, you know, the people that actually are in with kids, and, and coming up with what they think is the best. So I'm asking, can you do that in June so that the administration and the principals can come in with some ideas and a presentation for us so that when we start, we'll see it. And we always do at least two reads of these, so I'm happy to do a June and a July, or a June and early August, if, you know, if we can squeeze it in before, so that we can have two reads and get everybody on the same page. You know, if, if, if I'm happy to do that. I, I'm, you can make me, I'm happy to. I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do. Good. Um, I just don't want to slam it in during the school year. I'm not, not a lot I'm talking about, about slamming in, and I just want to, all I want to do is put it on the table. All right, it's on the table. So, well, and, and just so the record, and Mr. Zane, there was a thing called COVID that got away. This is discussion because we wanted to talk about this yeah. way three years ago. We, we, so this, we had that conversation. I appreciate you bringing it back up because Mrs. McKee and I, and along with you, had a real difficult time uh, yeah. out of here. So I, I think I want to bring it back up. And, it's worthy of a good conversation. Dr. Thank you. Does that come in work? Can you Actually, yeah, and I would agree with you. I think it, particularly policy 227 is not a policy that we want to change mid-year. Mm -hmm. It's a policy that we would want it stays consistent for the entirety of the school year, and then we can take a look at it and, and review it. And, and I think uh, our building administrators have a very strong um, thoughts about this policy and and quite frankly i think we really need to listen to their perspective because they are the closest to the situation when we have to enact this policy and they also are the ones that have to deal with you know any changes that we would make to this and what the implications of that are so i think it to your point it's very important for them to be involved in this and, and in sometime in june will that work I think it should. I yeah. Mean, we're giving a little heads up so you can fill it in, but uh, it would be some time. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think, to... yeah, I think we could do, uh, you know, we were doing policy like every three, four months. So, yeah, we could definitely schedule a policy committee meeting in June. At the end of June? After I, I, I will defer to the administration when in June that, that it works so that you can pull this off. Yep. And we'll also do some legwork and get some information. Well, uh, Dr. Ali, the only thing I would ask is. I have questions, and I, mean, I want to just be able, I think it's fair for the board who may have questions, that we get it to those folks who are coming to the meeting ahead of time, so they're not going to get back to us from the meeting, rather than come to the meeting with the answer. Um, Absolutely. Because I think that'll, that'll answer, that, I mean, it should answer most of our questions. Yeah, and I, and I and think... Give them time to work on it and be fair. Yeah, Because I, I think this, you're looking at a small window for doing June. You know, I want to make sure that my questions, the board's questions, your concerns are all addressed, you know, pretty much before we start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So obviously there'll be questions from the meeting, but I'd rather give you a whole yeah. bunch of If we could get those ahead of time, that way as they're they're doing we're doing research and thinking right. about I, I want to direct the board to funnel them to the two of you, just you. I, I you know, funnel that <coughs> to Dr. Elliott. Mm -hmm. And, and, and probably Mr. Fredrickson, just because he keeps a tally of Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah if you could yeah. copy me on that. Yeah, right. and, and I can go forward because we're going to do this. Correct. Send any questions individually. The board's going to discuss it in public. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you get a sense of the questions, you know, if anybody's got strong opinions, then, then you, you can be prepared. Right. That goes along. Right. And I will ride everybody to make sure they do that. Certainly. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a board comment at the end, but I'd like to open it up for public comment. Um, and then we, we will do it again. Um, I'm going to manage this much like we do school board meetings. I need you, anybody that wants to comment, we'll start down here and go around. I have a timer. You've got three minutes, but please get up, state your name and where you're from uh, before you give your comments. So uh, I'm looking, raise your hand, anybody that wants to give comment. Over here, you're first. Okay. Please stand up, uh, give your name, uh, where you're from, and I'll start the timer for you. Hello, my name is Ainsley Jordan. I am a junior at Council Member North, so I'm deciding to meet now. Um, this is my first in person meeting I've been to. It was very interesting to see. I have some notes on my phone. I made a discussion of how I found sort of how I was on my house and my 
why don't we have a lead in this and that? I think that's just so closing off the email that other people may be experiencing. Um, you don't know what's going to be a family in a homosexual family. You don't know how it's going to be struggles. And it's sad that if they are, they don't have an outlet or anything to read or have any kind of attention to it. And I think it's just a decision that shouldn't be made by you. It's not your child. The second thing I would like to speak on is the fact that um, we actually do have a forum. If you go to the Capital Rock School District website, um, it's public, so it's not just with our students. Um, you can look up certain books you want to read. There's details. I actually just looked up Mom Boy, and there's a good brief overview about what's in it. And if you do find lists or maybe a parent complains, and you see that they complain, you can look up this book online. So it's very public. So it's there for you if you do want to know what your child is reading, you see going in the room, somewhere like that, you can simply look it up um, on the website, so I'm kind of that. Yeah, same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Winnie. I'm from the school district. Uh, I'm from Newtown. Um, and I wanted to just to a couple of beautiful things. One, um, we were looking at some of the database just to prepare on that. Um, you can go to any of the tools. I've done it before. I can put in a subject title. So if I'm a parent and I have a concern about some subject, if I don't want uh, my child to find books on guns, if I don't want my child to read books on homosexuality, you can put that in the subject. It'll give you a list of books. You can click on the book. You can see what they're there about. You can then send those books that they can go to the school and say, I don't want my kids to take any of this out. Do you have that power as a parent? Um, if we're talking about parent choices, it exists already. Um, the problem is that we're talking about parent choices affecting other parent choices. And if you're putting books in a restricted section, you've taken the power away from other parents. And putting in an opt-in, you need to be very careful because you're essentially making a restricted section of books, and that's censorship. It's a, it's, it's a First Amendment right. Students have access and resources, access to, to resources and these materials. And by putting them in restricted areas and having an opt-in, you are censoring that information. And you're not allowing students to, to make choices, to find books that maybe represent themselves, that maybe open their eyes to different perspectives, to read about stories. And some of these are difficult. Some of these works. And some of these books have difficult subject matter. Absolutely. And maybe a parent doesn't want them to read it. But also you have to look at the full context of the book, not the excerpt. excerpt. Because when you're just reading these things online, when somebody comes for, you know, and, and reads something that sounds terrible and sounds horrible and makes us cringe a little bit, sure. But when you read the entire context of the book and what that person went through, if you look at something like the group's eye, uh, Everyone likes to talk about what happened to it. It is a difficult subject. And it isn't for everyone. It's not. But those excerpts are not the entire book. It is about trauma, and it is about healing, and it is about, it is a, a it's a work. It is a important literature. And to, I'm not sure how, when you're trying, you're trying to identify what those restricted books would be, because my version and your version might be different answers. And so when you're going to take the entire collection of anything that mentions homosexuality out of the library, are you then going to put it in a restricted section and anybody has to opt into all of those books? What if I said I don't believe in witchcraft and I don't want any Harry Potter books? You put that in a restricted section. It, you're, it's a very slippery slope. It's a First Amendment, right? And, and at some point, it's actually not going to hold up in court. And so you need to be very careful about how you're deciding to like restrict resources and materials from these kids. Parents will see it. They have that power. You can go look in the database. So. Yes, ma'am. Let me start. Yeah, I'm Carol Rackley. I'm a Newtown resident, retired educator from the North Bend School District. I want to thank the administration, the people here, because I know how hard you work, how dedicated you are. You're not just coming up with ideas. You do your research. You're educated. You know exactly what is coming from the best resources you have as a professional to select these books for the kids. Things do get by. 
you know, with kids watching TV, kids on video games, kids on Instagram, kids on TikTok, things get by. And as the adults, you have to be the one to say, hmm, I don't want to do good for you to watch. Um, let's talk about it. Everything's education. You don't hide it all from them. You teach them about it. You know, and I'm going to say this, I'm gay. I'm a homosexual. And when I hear somebody on the school board make an offensive or an uncomfortable comment about homosexual, I'm like, hmm, I was an educator for 30 some years. I couldn't even be out in my job as an educator. That crushes me. I think we have to be really cautious about how we present things to children. They're, they're great. We can teach them. Everything's a teaching moment. You can't control the internet. You can't control TikTok. You can't control, can't control. You teach them. And I, I just, I, I don't want to hinder our kids. We have to find the best ways to help them grow and learn and nurture them as parents. I get it. It's scary. I, I would be petrified. But not because of the books in, the, in the schools, because there's control. And you can say, this isn't good for my kid. And I get it. And you have the right to say, what is my, my age for my child? But you don't have the right to control the law. And this policy, I understand, and I get it. But when it comes to who's going to say what books are in there, I mean, I, I don't know about the process, but I hear the school board is going to take the next step and maybe look at all the books. And well, I hope there's transparency all, all, all in your life. So I just carry on close to me as an educator and as a person. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to be And I have my little number one on the phone. I can't compete with that. <laughs> Sir? Steve Lemkin, the little bird on Green Street. I don't have any kids, <laughs> but I pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> Happy to do that too. But I don't want stupid people coming out. And I want them to you know, know as much as possible. Throw something on the net today from Hannah Quinlan, American journalist and author. Ideas are only lethal. Use the press and don't discuss them. Ignorance is not bliss, it's stupid. Van Gogh shows you don't trust your kids to think about it, to think and you don't trust yourself to be able to talk to them. And having been an educator, teacher, and also a school staff employee, a printer in the school district, and living in several states, and uh, also a union worker in communication and organizing, that was the NEA, and happily retired. Uh, <laughs> my question, my answers to the parents, and I spoke to a lot of them, over the years, to talk to the kids. I mean, I heard things in the school quarters 40 years ago that would shock you now. They know what's going on. They know bodily parts. So let's get on with it. Uh, interesting, my father, I used to read a lot. I still read comic books at times. But when I was a paper boy, I had to read the the comic books and have to leave them in the park. But my mother did not approve of comic books. My father found this out because he was a truck driver, he knew all the cops, he knew everything in the world, in Jersey City. He would bring the cops to the home. I'd like to be. Don't worry, that's the mother I'll take care of that. And this is a man who also had a new bookshelf, uh, another day called Treason. I read that. And thankfully, my history teachers kept me on a better path than what was in that book. So I've had a lot of experience in this stuff. I. You know, and I know school boards. I've spoken in enough of them when I was working. So uh, you do what you got to do, but uh, please trust your kids and trust yourselves to talk to the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ezra Brickskin, I'm a senior at North. I live in Utah. Um, knowledge is power, and I'm scraping knowledge from young students who want to learn. It's wrong. That it's not simple. Um, there are several students in the district who might be queer and they don't know it yet. And they just want to find an outlet to make sure that it's okay. It's okay. And they want to know that it's okay to not fit into a heteronormative society, to not fit into a nuclear family. 
um, schools are the best place to do that. 13 year old kids have access to the internet. They don't want to go to the whole world. We don't need a shield out for them. We need to create a safe place for them to explore that and to set them on a path that can foster good conversation, foster effective conversation. That's how you empower students, not by restricting that. They're going to get their ideas. All the banning books are restricting books us and they don't want to read more. It's not simple. Um, yeah. Thank you. Please. Um, uh, name and where are you from? Uh, I'm Penny Schaefer. I'm a senior at Council Rock Florida. Um, I am a trans and queer youth in this district. Um, so I'm going to be like very like open about this. But in middle school, um, I did not have not good terms with middle school. Um, and I didn't have very supportive family either. So it's hard to be social. But um, to if my parents had restricted books that I found comforting, I probably likely would not be here today. I would be quite right. So if my parents had had the option to like restrict the access to the books that I like, wanted to read, I wouldn't have been comfortable with who I was and I wouldn't likely be standing here right now. Um, but here that you for I understand if you don't want your like children to read certain books. That is on you for decide, decide to decide for your child. That's not for you to imply on other students and that's going back to the point of if you have to opt into something, if a parent is going to have to opt in, that child's never be able to read that book. I was never be able to read the queer literature that I have in my life. Um, so I just think that restricting that and putting some sort of like lock on it where you have to like, oh, unlock it just to like read it, just to read any literature that like anyone should have access to. Um, it's really, really upsetting that that's actually a question that we're having right now. Um, yeah. Thank you. My name is Joel Rabb. I live in a township. Uh, I'm a media advisor. My children are grown up. I did not go to Council Rock schools except for, actually they did a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to say that one of my best friends uh, in Florida was is a retired librarian. You know, and it seems to me that you want to trust the librarians who are trained in this field as to what books should be in or out. Uh, and I'm so moved by what people here have said what was your name? Thank you so much for what I said. It's really good. So think think long and hard here about what you're doing. Thank you. All right. Oh. Hi. Just real quick. I'm Jessica Gallagher. Um, I just wanted to go off of what Penny said because um, I know right now the, the idea about the LGBTQ books is what you're talking about. But as an English teacher and as someone who worked really closely with our librarian for years, um, there are a lot of books that our kids go to that help them to connect to really big issues that they don't feel like they can talk to anybody about. And the books are written by authors that are in, you know, provides them with material and support so they don't feel alone. Books like um, books about let's say suicidal ideation, so that there are kids who will read a book like that and then they will feel comfortable enough because they don't feel as alone to tell a friend who then can tell a guidance counselor. I've watched it happen over and over and over again. So who decides what books are going to draw into that restricted section? And that's really concerning because they're going to get their information from the internet. And on the internet, there's a movie coming out about exactly what happened with two, like two, a couple texting each other about social media and how to actually kill yourself. So instead of having literature that could help them find the right um, guidelines to help them, they really turned to each other and it became a really dysfunctional in that particular um, case. But again, the other issue that had come up with eating disorders was another really big one that if those folks were put someplace else because nobody wants a kid to know about eating disorders, I don't know if that's the thinking, but I don't know what I don't know where the slope is gonna go. So 
that's another thing where a kid might see, I can give you examples, a kid sees their friend doing this, and then didn't know what it was, Cuddy was another one, didn't know what it was, saw them go, was able to, again, go to an adult. It's not like the kids are playing it to each other, but they're able to look at this material, it's been vetted by librarians, it's been vetted by educators, and it really does give them some, some information that's provided in a, a good context instead of a just random on the internet. So that again, guidance counselors and, and parents, teachers, parents, guidance counselors, I've seen it time and time again where you can get the system going to help kids. So I just worry that if we start to put a bunch of books off in a restricted area, who decides what's restricted? Is it going to be every single topic? We just feel uncomfortable with it. Or we all just feel uncomfortable with it. I don't know what that means. So. Thank you. All right. Board comments. Any board comments? Going once, going twice. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.